It's the <laughs> Razzmatazz Festival. Has anyone been to Razzmatazz Festival? <laughs> Which uh, showcases yeah. new, upcoming local talents, stories, poetry, music. Oh, I don't know if He's the mental in. health... He's bloody moving in, look at him. I'm moving in, for <laughs> <laughs> Mental health in the... Uh... <laughs> Because you've had lots of music, and I, I play lots of music, but I'm not going to play lots today because I'm going to mix and match a little bit. So I have a bit of performance poetry, uh, a couple of songs, and a, and a couple of very short readings from two books that are out there. Is that all right? Yeah. Oh, good. I do like a bit of participation. It helps me. Thank you, Gareth. I love the Chaz and Dave Hillbilly. That was brilliant. It's good, isn't it? Especially seeing as Chaz, this Chaz that passed away yesterday. Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Good job. There was Gemini Jim and Scorpio Sal. They were living by the Golden Gate. They was freezing their nose and wearing leather clothes and dealing every way but straight. They had a Leo dog and a Capricorn cat and everything was going fine till into their life on a moonless night came the man who got no sign. He stormed right in on an evil wind, and he rolled himself a righteous smoke. And as the thunder flashed and the lightning crashed, he took a toke and spoke. Said he was born on an astrological warp where the moon refused to shine on the cusp of now and nevermore came the man who got no sign. Now Pisces Ben, who was Jim's best friend, said, man, you must be blind. You better take your knife and take the life of this man who's got no sign. And then it happened. And the blood soaked the ground. The arrest was made by Sheriff Slade. He was an Aquarius through and through. But the jailer, he was a Sagittarius, so he beat Jim Black and blue. They marched him up the courthouse stairs. I said, Jim, how do you plead? Jim said, hey man, the moon's in Virgo, the blame can't lie with me. <laughs> now the jury all were Libras, so you know they were more than fair. But his lawyer, he was an Aries, and Aries just don't care. Well, the judge, he was a cancer, and cancers have few friends. But the hangman was a Taurus, and that's where the circle ends. <laughs> <laughs> I've lived up in the, uh, <coughs> in the Swansea Valley, just down the road from Gareth's Am, for about the last 18 years, well, no, 17 years. 16, 17 years. And uh, when I first moved up there, bought this sort of farmhouse type place that was a kind of semi that had been boom, and was really unhappy there. Really, really unhappy. Didn't know why. Had to get out of there and moved as the crow flies 300 yards right up the mountain on this plateau, in this really isolated, ancient cottage, which was haunted. Now, unbeknownst to me at the time, and it didn't materialise till some time later, the guy who lived in the house I first moved into was a fellow called Morgan Lewis, who was an under gamekeeper for R.D. Goff, who in those days owned the valley. And the fellow who lived in the cottage I moved into was a fellow called Di Davies. He was a poacher and a little bloke, and everybody loved him. Everyone loved a poacher. Di killed Morgan in 1850, on the 25th of February. And I'll relate the story with a little bit of a reading and a song. Stuart, I have to thank, because when I discovered this story, the first thing I did was to write a song, wasn't it, really? And I will tell you this before I go any further. The house was haunted, wasn't it, Stuart? Big time, big time. Real, real shit. Oh, yes. <laughs> now, Morgan Lewis 
when he was around, was malevolent. He wasn't nice. His energy felt bad. There are people, sadly not here who can witness it, but there were people who'd visited me in the cottage and had had experiences themselves. One lady, in front, for example, was washing up one day, a friend of mine's wife, and she felt this dig in the back, of, a nice gentle dig in the back, and a little voice, woman's voice in her head saying, that's my job. And I did used to come downstairs and things had been moved around in the night and all sorts of stuff. Anyway, Di killed Morgan, right? There's the farmhouse, there's the cottage, there's the chapel. In the chapel graveyard, and the headstone is still there today, it says, here lies Morgan Lewis, whose life was taken by a stone thrown by the hand of David Davies. And years ago, there was a sculpted hand top of the head start pointing up at the top. When I finished writing the song, I couldn't get a last line. And I, it took me, seriously, I wrote the song in maybe a week, but it took me a year to find the last line of it. And the night that I did find it was very early in the morning. And when I sang this last line, which we'll hear shortly, the whole atmosphere changed. Morgan appeared again, only this time, not benevolent, smiling, smiling. And Di appeared on this side. Oh, I can't say time. I played the song, I sang the last line as they'd appeared. They disappeared. The house was clean. They never came back. I can't tell you how bereft I was. What did you say to me at the time? Stuart did a, a, a whole uh, radio program, which was about the best, nearly an hour, wasn't it, really? which was done along the same lines as uh, Down Your Way on radio four years ago, wasn't it? On the trail of the Battle of Penny Grag. It's worth listening to. It's on the whole stories up there, isn't it, really? It is. Anyway, without more ado, I'll set the scene for you before I sing the song. Probably, I, since I've had my cataracts, I have to wear glasses. It's bloody weird. It's terrible. It's called the Ballad of Penny Grag. A poacher leaned against the foot of a large sycamore tree staring at the empty snare on the moss in front of him. Nearly on the cold, wet ground, icy from the winter night, nearly done, our poacher picked up an empty snare, examined it closely. Strands of hair and fur stuck to the snare, stained with blood, now frozen from the early morning. No doubt in his mind, young, sharp eyes quickly scanned the forest to the left, right and in front. Turning quickly, nobody to be seen, only bare trees and shadows. Listening in silence, there was nothing unusual or untoward to disturb the end of night and the beginning of a new day, excepting the distant bark of a dog fox echoing through the forest. Perhaps this vocal carnivore was the thief. Frozen evidence held firmly by his icy fingers informed our poacher of a rabbit once caught, now gone. Foxes often raided snares, snatching the helpless victim but the disturbance on the ground and the fact that the snare had been undone to release its prisoner informed him that the fox was innocent of this crime. Gently, our poacher stroked the ground where the snare had lain throughout the night. Blood specks in frozen suspension splattered across the snare's residual image indented on the earth and moss. Slightly off to his right, two large imprints of boots were clearly frozen into the moss. Similar prints faded on the solid earth off to the left. Our poacher mused and muttered under icy breath. If the thief was that fox, it was on two legs and wearing huge boots. Bare trees offered no shelter from the biting January winds, pulling a woolly muffler around his neck and shivering, he got to his feet. Putting the empty snare in the bag that was hanging from his shoulder, sharp eyes took a last look at the scene in front of him. This was the seventh snare found empty this morning. There had been four yesterday that had suffered the same fate and also a number over the last couple of weeks. Our poacher was being poached. Spitting on the ground, he cursed under frozen breath and turned towards home with an empty bag. There would be no rabbit stew today. Heading for Pennygry Farm, he trudged through the forest and down the mountainside. A thin layer of snow covered everything as far as the eye could see. The sun was starting to rise, but the cold perished our poacher to the very core of his bones, adding to the increasing sense of anger and frustration 
that invaded his every cell. He knew that somebody must have been following him and springing the snares. But who was it? He was angry, very angry. As the morning mist started to lift from the trees, our poacher, Di Davies, walked through the farm gate. Jenkins and Big John were eating breakfast when the door opened with an urgent creak as the rusty hinges held the gusts of freezing cold, morning air drifting in. Their little brother, Di, stood in the doorway. Shut the bloody door, Di! Jenkins spluttered crumbs across the breakfast table. Di slammed the door shut behind him, but caught himself on the handle, creating searing pain in his cold fingers, still numb from nocturnal poaching. Di swore under his breath and kicked the door in return for this assault upon his person. Take it easy, Di Bark. Too early for temper. I finished. You can clap if you want, boy. <laughs> for you. Uh, and uh, Di, in short, got extremely pissed on the 25th of February <laughs> and went up against Morgan Lewis three times in the village, witnessed by loads and loads of people. And on the very final time he went up against him, he hit him with a stone, a small stone, jumped up. Di was uh, five foot seven, Morgan was six foot three. Di jumped up and hit him on the head, right in the middle. Morgan smacked him again, sent him on his way. Three days later, Morgan was dead, went into a coma. Di! Biggest scandal ever to hit the Estragon Rise Valley, there's never a Slavera Valley, there's never been one as big since. And in those days, in those days, if you, uh, if you were done for manslaughter, which Di ended up being doing, you would have gone to Australia, that was mandatory, you know, transportation. Ooh. But Di had consumption, so he didn't go, he got three months in, so he did which, of course, in 1850, was no holiday either, you know. It's called about the penny Well, they don't cock in the miners on a cold and witchy night. Morgan Lewis, a gatekeeper, not a man you'd want to fight. Well, 39 and a wife and five, tied courage on a hill. Oh, 84 died Davies, who he would surely kill. Well, die he was a young man, five feet seven or more. From the age of nine in the ironworks, he charged the factory floor. At night he went a poaching, all in the forest knew just why. But on that fateful night, Morgan Lewis, he would die. Well, money passed between them, and only then knew why. Ty stepped up to Morgan, throwing blows at his eyes. Oh, Morgan stepped aside, picked Di out from his shoes. 